Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and uh, I guess this is part 2.1 of my interview with uh, a legend uh, of bass and uh, theory and just an overall great cat. Uh, Larry Klein, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you. Now now we can be sure not to uh, (laughs) get uh, interrupted with cell phone uh, failure and interference. Well, and then uh, you don't have anything on the calendar, at least right now, which is good, because you, no, you, no, could, you I'm, could... I'm all right here. I'm you could right literally here, hear sir. your brain, like, being stretched in, like, two days. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Like, no, you no, were no. trying to think, but you were preoccupied. Too much going on. Too much, <laughs> so, too much multitasking for me. I, I, I lined... I, I did this interview with this cat two days ago, um, and, and he, he said something that, that caught my attention. So I want you to listen to it, and, uh, and, just, and then we'll come back and, and break it down. Okay. Point. I'm looking at this saying, my God, he had so much influence, or that band in particular seems to have had a huge he, influence. He, you know, at that time, he was he was still the cat who had played with Bird. Wow. You know, and uh, uh, but that his playing, like when he was playing with Bird, he was more like a you know a bebopper like Bird was, but then. As the the birth of you know before the recording the birth of the cool you know he started playing what they uh, what they called cool you know the cool sound uh, which was the longer notes and the mel- you know and emphasis on the sound of the horn and uh, you know rather than a, a lot of notes exactly uh, whereas train was playing a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about so. All right, I didn't. Me- that was Charles Neville, who I was talking to, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and he was talking about Miles. Uh, he, we didn't actually bring up his name, but what what caught my attention was that I had, I was thinking of you because you talked about those those plug nickel sessions from '65 mm-hmm. that you had referenced last time. And what's a, Charles? A lot of people don't know this, but he actually lived in New York for most of the '60s, so he was like basking in that culture and that jazz. And he said, well, you just heard the quote, Miles at that time, and this is kind of cool for someone like me who's just trying to paint this picture of of our cultural heritage, is that he was just known at that time as the guy who played with Bird. And, you know, and and, and I wanted you to talk, like, when you heard the Plug Nickel sessions, did you know, I mean, you you told the classic story later that I guess Herbie told you where they were just going to, do their own thing and hope it worked out with miles. But did you, was miles, he said miles was just known as the guy who played with bird. You know, he was a B, and well, I that, want, I wanted you to talk about that. Well, that, that I would say was more true of the late fifties, uh, or, or, the, or even, yeah, the mid to late fifties. I think Charlie Parker died in, 56 I think and uh, and so you know after that point Miles went out on his own and started you know started really playing with his band and developing his thing and st- started out with with um, Philly Joe and and um, you know Cannonball and uh, you know that 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 whole uh, crew of guys that that uh, was a sort of a uh, gradually evolving thing that ended up you know where train ended up being part of it as well and and then uh, it developed from there but by the by the early 60s miles was already firmly on his his own course I think you know I don't know exactly which I don't know what year the birth of the cool came out but i remember like like for instance miles live at, at lincoln center i believe that was 68 and that was with with uh ron uh tony george coleman 
and Herbie, and so that's that's fairly far. That, that's oh, that's far on. And then short, right after that, I think Sam Rivers briefly played with Miles, uh, and there was a live record of that that was recorded in Japan. Wow. And then wow. And that was when Wayne joined. Was subsequent to Sam Rivers, I believe. And and you had that that group that ended up doing the the plug nickel stuff. So so I think I think we're talking about by the time the plug I'm not again I'm not sure but I think uh, the plug nickel stuff was probably recorded in '69 or or even '70. I'm not I'm, I'd be interested to see look that up. Yeah, I have see. to look that. I thought it was early. I mean, it was just you know what it is. I here's the question: Do you think? See, like, what's been revelatory is that you know, I was transcribing my interview with Jim Keltner, and, and Keltner mm-hmm. used, used to hang with, uh, I don't know if you ever went to the Dragon Whip. Albert Stenson. That, I mean, is, is, dude, that, is that what you talked with Jim about? Dude, Jim and I have done three hours of interviews about Albert Stinson, <laughs> okay? like. <laughs> no, I've, I've talked a lot about Albert Stinson. Dude, Albert too. Stinson, he, I was, him and Bobby Hutcherson were saving Albert's life every night because he was so strung out. I mean, his, his yeah. wife would call him up. Yeah. and they, I mean, they, this is where Keltner, and, and then Keltner was driving to the top of a mountain to play at Paul Lagos' house, too. And it's like, the, 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 it, but what Keltner said, because he used to sit and, like, and hang with Jack Folks and, uh, at the Dragon Wick and see uh-huh. uh, Charles Lloyd play with, with Bobby Hutcherson. And, mm. but, but do you think that, like, Miles, not to over, you know, Miles started the birth of the cool before they dubbed it birth of the cool i mean he was starting that that sort of mm-hmm. type of music but uh charles lloyd train sonny rollins charles neville albert tootie heath and many others they were playing r&b before bebop and i mm-hmm. i'm i'm just thinking were miles those guys were how can you talk about uh because that was revelatory for me i just assumed those guys came in as jazzers but then it's like no they were playing with blues bands that could play jazz and i and i wanted to know how you how that how you feel like that helped them develop their individual sound you talk about charles or the, any of the horn players but like albert Tudy, he, albert heath was playing rhythm and blues or rock whatever you want to say before before bebop and i just wanted to oh, that's interesting yeah yeah maybe maybe r&b more than rock like uh, yeah now rock because right. Tootie, was, you know, he goes back to the. I, 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 I would guess he, he he was playing around in the late fifties and early fifties, early fifties, uh, yeah, early fifties. Yeah. So, yeah. so those guys, you know, a lot of them were 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 either playing on the Chitlin circuit, you know, playing R and B and you know stuff in that era, or they were even, you know, some of them were recording with a uh, with blues and soul bands i mean even if you go further up uh you know more recent into the 60s you have like people like earl palmer who started in new orleans i think probably playing with fats domino and stuff you know and then ended up becoming a jazz you know everybody who played i think in in that era who everybody who played in r&b and and uh uh, blues and you know in those kind of bands they all either were jazz players or aspired to be I think you know because because you know jazz was like the, you know it's like like the like the Kabbalah in, in uh, Judaism or something, you know it was it was like you know jazz was the 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 the, the, the sophisticated kind of higher language or something and and I think I think that that uh, for so many musicians, especially black musicians during during those decades, you know that they they uh, um, if if they were jazz players and they came up as jazz players, then they played the other stuff to pay the bills, you know, uh, so to speak, or, or or maybe not, maybe not. I mean, like you know, even Charlie Parker, if you you know when you when you start really reading about people. Or reading dialogues with him, or interviews with people who were around him, you know, he was really an omnivore. You know, I mean, he he loved, you know, blues and and uh, everything you, you can think of. And I mean, he was he was quite liable to if he was passing by a bar 
and heard a good band and in, in, inside to go in and start playing with them. You know, I, I, I think I think he was not a, at all kind of hierarchical about uh, about bebop as you know. Of course, the people who came in his wake, you know, became very you know sort of a. Uh, uh, you know, they look. I think they look down on the other forms and consider bebop to be. You know, well, this is the real shit. You know. Yeah, man, you're, and, you're uh, nailing this because when I was just Kenny Burrell, I, I was doing. I, I interviewed Kenny a while, like a while ago. But you know, you're talking about. I mean, literally, John Lee Hooker. There were there were no name blues guys who were playing in Detroit at that time. But the blues was right alongside the jazz. It was right there. Yeah. It was, and you actually, yeah. what's so classic is that you called yourself. As far as a, a, a someone who's absorbing and digesting music, you called yourself an omnivore in, in our first interview. Yeah. So it's like, this is really what the crux of it is that it jazz, jazz became an inside joke at a certain point where it was like the, it, it got too complex and got too far away from the blues. And 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 I say to myself, when you like, how how do we keep that? Do cats go back far enough today in the lineage of music? It's not like there's a snobbery today, but it's that connection that it's all music and that it's not mm-hmm. it's this stratification between some one is better than one is better than the other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I you know, I think that's a big issue in in a way. I mean, and because that's how you know, there becomes this kind of and I, I you know, we've we've alluded to this in talking before and I've kind of talked about the fact that for me, this kind of thing was part of what what sent me kind of into other areas musically and really, you know, away from jazz. And that, and that, you know, as I started encountering on the road, especially, you know, like you know, where you'd be playing on festivals and and there'd be there'd be this attitude. Um, from from some musicians, you know, you, you'd get it kind of, you know, in de- degrees of subtlety or or overt kind of behavior of, of saying, well, you know, obviously you guys aren't really p- playing the shit, you know, the real shit, you know, like if if, if someone might be playing with Art Blakey, playing just straight ahead, bop kind of stuff you know they might look at at what uh we were doing say with freddie you know when where you know i mean freddie you know successfully and unsuccessfully depending on uh, on which which projects or what you know which uh specific period but he was searching around trying to you know he was searching around trying to find fresh ground that was in between things and finding ways to hybrid uh, uh, musical elements and you know his hero in that respect and in most respects was miles in that in that way and so so you know when you would encounter people you know saying oh well you guys obviously aren't really playing the stuff you know and, and the stuff referring to bebop where you're you know, just running your ass off and, <laughs> yeah, right, and, and right. playing as as much and everything you know in one solo, um, you know that that's that's a, a real problem. And it and it only I I think my theory is that it only that it's a generational thing. Yeah, you know, like that the, the that the guys that that actually come up with the language, whether it's Train or Miles or Charlie Parker, that these guys, um, that they don't have. I think you generally find that they don't have that kind of snobbery towards towards other idioms and st- towards other tributaries musically. They they tend to be, you know, sort of wide open souls. You know, I mean, I I, I did this project recently about charlie parker it's an album about him as opposed to anything it's, it's sort of a, i'm waiting to hear those tracks a, man i'm waiting to hear it, them. <laughs> i know i still have to send you that it's all right but, we'll get but, it uh, yeah we'll get it done but but the but the you know it's more a, 
a, a play about that archetype, the, the, the type of person who's just always moving musically, always, always restless and always searching for something new and different to explore. And, and generally, my uh, experience has been that that when you find those people, whether it's Picasso or or Joni or or um, or Miles or Charlie Parker, the, these kind of people, that they're, they're like they're like a, a a candle burning too bright, you know, and they're just you know like they're they're moving forward at light at the speed of light, you know, and they um, and and they they sort of can't be bothered to you know with the relatively childish business of, of, of dissing other art forms, you know, and or, or other other forms that are in reality so closely related, like, you know, blues or, or R and B or you know, and, and and um I mean I think that it's an interesting thing, like like even you take Charlie Parker and then you take Dizzy, to me and the, the, you know this is just my opinionated opinion <laughs> but uh but but uh dizzy was kind of a you know a, 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 of the two of them of course they were together when this this new language started coming together that you know he was dizzy struck always strikes me and i i i met him and talked to him a number of times i think i might have played with him once or twice and it, it, during the years you think you did or you did you think you did or you did i think i i i think that i did (laughs) i certainly was around him a lot like like during during the years when i was doing festivals because i remember i I mean the incidents that i remember though were 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 sort of (laughs) (laughs) non-musical off the band he was was such a character oh yeah but 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 i but i um (laughs) but he he strikes me when i read stuff that he said about about beat, about music in general, as as sort of a, a bit overly intellectual in a certain way about it, and and certainly much more intellectual than Charlie Parker was. You know, like I think, I think Charlie Parker just it was just music to him. You know, like whereas whereas Dizzy was, you know, he looked at it in a bit of more of a um, I don't know. To me, kind of a slightly jaundiced way, like where he. Where he, I, I, I read one thing where he was talking about Charlie Parker. That, oh, and then Charlie Parker came and he brought the pyrotechnics to it. You know, where I, where I thought, you know, oh, that, that's kind of a, feels crass to me in some some sort of way. You know, and 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 sort of distanced from the inspiration of the thing. You know, but but uh, anyhow, I guess the point. No, was no, no. I want, I want to read. I want to just. I want. I want to read you this quote because you're. You're. I, I want to see what you think about this. This is from Mike Longo, who played with, who was Dizzy's. Uh, he wrote a lot of a lot of compositions for Dizzy in the '60s. Played with him. He goes, uh, with Dizzy, the drummer became like a horn. Dizzy and Charlie Parker represented the contrapuntal era of jazz. And Dizzy used to use the term the the melodization of rhythm. Drums became part of the counterpoint. And there was another thing that made Dizzy's music different than the old jazz was the inclusion of 5-4 into the time flow. Prior to that, that wasn't there. It took me a while to figure out what he was doing. He was doing rhythm with his hands, and he said most of the jazz musicians understand the 3-4 and the 6-8 and the 4-4, but the 5 is another thing altogether. I can play a 5-4 and a 4-4 at the same time. That primarily added a different kind of accentuation. If you notice, every Charlie Parker tune and solo can be played on a snare drum. They took what was in the drums and made melody out of it. Essentially, Dizzy was playing the drum on the trumpet. So, I mean, it did, it did, there's just so much going through my head. I mean, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this. It's just, I, I, I think more to the point, I just like you talk to peeps out there about why it's important not to have the snobbery. Why did you choose, oh. why did you choose to go, because like Henry Franklin, who was the bass player with Freddie before you took over. Okay, he hated the electric bass. He played yeah. it. He, I mean, you know, he sang for his supper, and there are some yeah. incredible live tunes because your boy, my man, our boy Carl Burnett was on drums and Cables uh-huh. was on. 
But he hated the. But I mean, was that the kind of thing you people would be getting would be dissing you if like you didn't bring the, play the upright and you're playing the electric? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, and, and by the time by the time uh, the bands that I was a part of with Freddie evolved, you know, we were just taking it into a a place that was kind of genreless to me you know like it but it was but it was it, it sometimes got loud and it sometimes got pretty pretty um, uh rhythmically sort of somewhere between rock and 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 some kind of mutant hybrid of jazz you know like i mean this was this was the era this was the era where you you know you had you know miles was doing get up with it and, and oh yeah uh, oh it was and, ridiculous and some, of, some of those records that were that were really um you know that were really going into a new kind of improvisation and so and so i think i think that freddie was open to it and and the guys that that uh were were playing in the band including myself we were all loving it you know like i mean we'd, we'd go out on stage and we we wouldn't really know where the music was going to go it, it it could go up off into some really sort of some kind of uh you know cosmic rock oriented stuff that was you know uh that was quite abstract and and but rhythmically was more rock oriented and 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 you know and at, on one hand freddie was excited by that idea but then when it would get too loud and too too kind of you know sort of sort of you know he'd always remind us hey listen you know i'm playing an acoustic instrument here you know <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta remember i don't want to blow my lip out here you know but um but I, i'll i'll tell you what for me is at the center of the thing is that is that it's it's something it's a principle that I think kind of applies to philosophy to religion to um, almost anything in the world you know and that is that almost inevitably you know you, you have a a guy who is a one of these giants that I'm talking about these people who think well, what it is I, to me is that the key of it is that they they are these kind of restless spirits who who just cannot settle for doing something that is just successful. You know, they they're, they're driven towards the fresh thing, and and whether it's you know whether that's Jesus or that's um, Charlie Parker or that's uh, you know Lennon and McCartney or or or, or, or uh, Larry Klein. Miles, you know, well, you know, I'm. I mean, I'm driven. You know, I, I certainly aspired. I mean, I have that kind of gene inside me. You know, like, and and I, 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 you know, to you know, for better or for wor worse. You know, it's like yeah. I, I always new. It's about new ground. Yeah. It's about breaking new. It's fresh ground. You keep saying it. It's fre yeah. It's fre fresh, fresh ground, and and something different and new and. And and you know, and sometimes you know, of course, like you, you know, with it, it's the um, it's a curse and a blessing for ev everybody who has that thing because you could you know certainly on a on a material level you can be much more successful if you find something that's kind of hits at the center of the public taste. But but whether it's you know even with Jesus, you know, like you you get Jesus and then you get. Uh, Paul, who follows him and kind of figures out, okay, well, let's see if I take the edges off of this thing that he was doing and make it a little bit more palatable to the public and and stuff. This this is really good. And I'm not saying that he was. I'm not saying that Paul was crass or or calculated in that. But but some people have that impulse, you know, like to 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 that that making something catch fire with the public is going to is going to make them that's the key to success for them or or satisfaction and so so i think that 
I think that with the people who follow these kind of groundbreakers generally are the ones that look down on on things that are you know art forms that are hybrids or or sort of sub, you know uh, different from what is considered to be the sophisticated hip thing you know the, the, those the, the originators don't have that i don't think you know i think that they're you know they're just they're just following this kind of blazing thing inside them you know well i mean did you do have you read that book uh, uh nika's dream for the baroness from new york did you know oh no i haven't no so i mean did you know who the baroness was Mark? yeah sure oh, i know right. i know all about that whole story yeah well i mean because the story just it, it could it, basically uh charles neville was uh he went to uh, Minton's uh, to see uh, it was it was Monk's birthday. It was such a great story. He he said that he didn't understand because they <clears throat> they were play they were playing a trio. Everybody was there with their horns. People that had played with Monk and maybe had, but there was all these cats there. And then, but but for the for the first hour or so, I mean, nobody was picking up their horns. And Neville's like, "What the hell's going on here?" You know. And then he didn't know who the Baroness was, but the, this woman winds up tinking on a glass, and she said, "Now we cut the cake." And she put the knife in Monk's hand and held his hand, and they cut the cake. And when they cut the cake, everybody took their horn out and broke. It. They they did the fastest bebop version of Happy Birthday that Neville. He didn't even know there was that many changes in in that tune. Okay, and, uh -huh. and at that point, they just started burning. But the point is that in that book, uh, it, it, it the Baroness would ask the cats if they could be granted three wishes right now. What would it be? And most of the guys said our first wish would be that jazz could be accepted as a legitimate art form in America like it is in Europe. And the next one was that I could make enough money playing jazz to support my family. And so I just remember talking to Skip. You know, I've gone, I've hung with Skip in, in his house and, you know, done many. And he just said, you know, Freddie wanted to make money, too. I mean, ultimately, you're trying to make, yeah. you know, there's this balancing act between and I think that that's where the snobbery comes in, where it's like, well, you know, we're trying. I mean, again, you guys were all like omnivores and just trying to stretch the music. But in some ways, people look at that and they say, well, it's not pure. It's not pure. But you're trying to make mm -hmm. trying to make some dough. And it's clear that jazz has never really been accepted going back to Monk's time. It's never been appreciated. The music has never been appreciated in this country. And it's been very hard to make a living playing jazz. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's it, to me, it's. um Yeah. This is another uh, soundbite I have. That's for... true. That, yeah, that's that's part of it. That's part of the discussion as well, of course. And 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 you know, you could say that that uh, yeah, I, I I know what Henry was saying. Um, I mean, you could say that part of um, part of Freddie's using Freddie as an example. Freddie's motivation was you know, that he wanted to make money um, as well. But, um, you know, also, I th you know, at the, so, so yes, I mean, there, there is, there is a component of the thing that, that is that, and, and it's true that the jazz has always been the, been the sort of, uh, um, Oh, you know, under it's the biologically under, ignored child of this country. Exactly, right? The stepchild. Right, right. Like it's the, not the a stepchild though. Corner. It's it's blood though. I mean, it's it, it was birthed yeah. in this country, but it doesn't want to be yeah. acknowledged as such. You know? Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, I mean, you know, that's uh, that's absolutely true, and and I think that I think that uh, that uh, the U.S. is always slow coming to to. To new fresh things, you know, you know, it's it's so often that that something has to become popular in Europe and, or England before it before it is accepted here. Um, I mean, you certainly see that, you know, in the in in that kind of uh, transition from the Sinatra crooner era to to the Beatles and 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 the, the next place as far as the as far as the general populace is concerned you know and really broad cultural trends you see that and 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 but but i think that that uh 
you know, that also, it's all sort of braided together in a certain way. Like, I mean, when you, when, when you would talk to Miles, which I did some, not as much as some folks, but, but, you know, his, his, I mean, he had a, I'm sure that, that, that money had a, a place in the, in his thinking when he was, when things were evolving. But at the same time, it was like, it was like this kind of fluid aesthetic kind of uh, uh, progression of thought where he would look at, you know, at that, at that point when Hendrix was exploding and Sly and the Family Stone was happening, he'd look at and feel the music that was, that, that was there and think, whoa, I want some of that. I want some of that energy, you know. And of course, you know, he'd also see all the everybody focusing on those records and buying those records and and you know, like anyone, a human being, he wanted to be appreciated and accepted a lot. So there was sort of maybe maybe in the rear view mirror there was this this idea of of making some more money. But I I I do think that that with those guys that money um overall was was a, a subsidiary issue and concern that that that, that y- you know at a certain point how many times do you want to play all the things you are you know um <laughs> no i mean i i just i mean but it was i just i i were i mean literally it was you can talk about this sort of it it it, it, first of all, it didn't hurt that that Miles was actually like on the bandstand at the Fillmore West with other with, with possibly with Sly Stone or, or the Grateful Dead. I mean, there he he, he yeah. could he he could vie and those 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 bands had as much he had as much impact on, on those bands as anything else. But I mean, this is a, I just transcribed this from Keltner. This is literally 1960. Talk about the cost of living, the civil rights movement. I mean, just listen to what he says. He says, um, Great. he says, during the late 60s, I was playing with Bobby Hutcherson and John Handy at the Both Ann Club. Uh, after, the last, <laughs> after the last set, guys would come up and sit in. Hampton Hawes sat in with us. It was ast- <laughs> this is the greatest line. It was astonishing to see that man in person, let alone play. And then he says, Jack DeJanette would come and hang out. I got to be really good friends with Jack. I had already met Jack before. This is it. We traded sandals in the parking lot at Huntington Beach at the Golden Bear. I mean, it was, oh, uh, you know, all right, so it's like, I mean, what I'm saying is that there was a willingness to, uh, there was, like, even though Keltner had not been in the studios at that point, really, um, there was an acceptance that these, what these guys were doing, they were operating on a different frequency, and it was, yeah. it was respect. And, like, Jack was playing with Charles Lloyd, and Jack was playing... I mean, but he was he was playing everything, and they were trading sandals. It was I I, don't, I hate to use the word hippie, yeah. hippie, but it was like that's what it was, and it's it's now become like music in general. The significant, I think that's what we're just talking about in general. It's, it to me, it's a little bit humbling because throw it all away. However, they communicated. Miles was a Zen master, and Train had his own way, and Bird had his own way. I mean, I think that those guys and many others really understood that their legacy was being able to pass on the, the, the lineage and the knowledge and the love to future generations. And they had that opportunity every night on the bandstand and mm-hmm. there was this touring circuit. And I just wonder now uh, how bottled up that is or how, the different forms that it takes in today. The fact that you guys now are those masters in the lineage and, uh, and, and, and whether or not that, how, how frustrating it is to not, truly be able to communicate nightly on the bandstand maybe you don't want to do that anymore but the point is that the 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 ability to translate and to push forward the lineage is not available in our culture the way it was at that time yeah well yeah i mean that's that's you know it's it's a I there's mean, no answer there for it. there's no so an- much to, yeah i mean there's, there's so much to talk about in that area you know i mean to me <laughs> You know, actually, this record I've been just working on. We've been talking about some of this, some of the kind of tangential offshoots of, of what we're speaking about. Because, of course, I mean, 
for for me, I look around and I see some guys, you know, who have this kind of omnivorous forward motion, like someone like Chris Potter, for example. Right. Okay, like Chris Potter is is one of you know he's one of the guys of this one of the certainly horn players of this era that that is has that kind of wide open thing you know like i mean he's a he's as much of a scholar of paul simon's lyrics as he is of uh, of trains you know solos as you know i mean it, you know he's all he's over a, yeah, he's, he's, he's he's everywhere he's oh everywhere he's a great drummer he's he, he, he you know he's just looking forward now you know now you're right i mean in that like you know these bands that used to be the training ground for musicians coming up whether it was art blakey's band or freddie or miles or or um you know the all, horace silver the all these bands that had sort of you know that existed by by touring and they and they recruited recruited promising young guys and that was your that was as freddie would put it your you're going to get your masters here you know and that, 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 that was and it was that you know that you you know whether you had learned whether you had gone to uh traditional uh, music school and learned uh, learned your stuff there you know when you got into those bands that was where you really refined and, and discovered where you were going and um and that now you don't have that, you know. You don't; those those people are disappearing all the time, and and um, and you don't have that kind of thing. So you have this situation, and this is this is sort of a a, a, a parallel discussion where you have these the, the schools that are teaching jazz and teaching uh, musicians how to do this. It's that. It, there's sort of institutions that are trying to standardize how to teach the stuff that people used to learn on their own and then with the touring and playing with these masters. Exactly, exactly. That you have those things, and those those entities, like Berkeley, for example, they're they're exploding. They're so successful, right? Uh, you know, because, because more financially ever, Financially successful, yeah. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But they're, and they're cranking these musicians out who do, they don't have that thing you know they don't have the thing that you got from the masters because it's not it, of course it's not the same thing you can't you can't teach a lot of things you know or it's very difficult to anyhow but you have those places exploding you know uh, berkeley just bought avatar studios in new york city you know like i mean they're the, all these studios and and th- things are going down but and the and these educational uh, entities are gobbling them up and getting bigger and bigger. And all you still have as many kids as ever who are driven to love music and want to study it and stuff. But you don't have the training ground for them to really develop in in this kind of way that that to me, anyhow, maybe you know this is my vision. That to me was it, it was. Uh, um, it had enough gray amorphousness to it that it that it it bred these kind of people who who were individuals. Instead, you have schools, and they're cranking out thousands and thousands of guys and women, and and uh, and where are they going to go? You know. Well, the question what is this: also, do? is that I mean, on top of that, I mean. I just with the the tri- the things that I've been listening to with I mean the interviews that I did with Burrell and and Charles I mean Kenny Burrell he said you can't expect youngsters to replicate the sound of John and then again Kenny's the Burrell as you know is is the jazz, is the head of the music school at mm-hmm. at UCLA he said yeah you can't expect youngsters to replicate the sound of John Lee Hooker some kids try they learn that but the real blues fan or jazz fans can say well, what where's your story and Neville was saying Sonny Stitt always 
whatever he said, he said everything's in the scales of the horn. It's like a cube. But he said, you also just always want to have your own sound. And that, to me, I don't think that yes. in academia you could ever. That's the point is that they're cranking out people that and there's so much material to learn how to play like somebody else. That has become yes. the, the standard. OK, it's no yeah. longer where with Bird and Miles and all these cats, Freddie, it was always about, dude, they'd slit their wrists if somebody came. They'd probably go out go to blows if they said, hey, you sounded just like this. That was like yes. the biggest insult. So that's the danger for me societally, not even music wise. I'm just talking when you start turning people into droids and you start saying, no, it's just formulaic stuff. That's how you get what happened. That's I mean, I don't want to go to the extreme, but I am. That's how you get another Holocaust. That's how, in different forms. But that's, yes. you know, I yes. mean, all I'm saying is that's because people the, aren't, aren't they're not thinking they're not thinking for themselves. themselves. No. Yeah. And, and, you know. I mean, on my on my own little small, in my my small mi microcosm of <laughs> yeah. issue, this issue we're talking about, yeah. like one one thing that I want to do, and I'm talking with them at Berkeley School of Music, you know, th th those people. I've been talking with them for a long time about doing a master's class thing, or or somehow how kind of getting involved there, and because I, you know, I'm doing what I can. I take I take on interns here and there, and or mentor young guys who want to be uh, a, a lot of them are players I, probably most of them are p bass players who want to be record producers right so so I'll you know and I'll do I do what I can to to try and help people and then uh, you know I've thought about well how do you do this how do you how do you put this into an ed educational kind of thing because if you if you're talking about producing records the job is different every single time you do it because the job is 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 to you know take an, an artist who who you see clearly you know like who that person is and spot where is where what exactly is the flame that's burning inside this person that makes them whether it's what they do instrumentally or their writing or their a combination of both, their voice, who they are, what is that flame? And then you want to you want to fan that thing and and make it splay out into in, in, into every uh, part of what they're doing, so that you have this thing that is you know that takes them hot even higher than what they're. That what they think they're capable of at a given juncture, you know, and so it's always depending on the artist and what they need, what their weak areas are, what their strengths are. It's always different. So the only way that I can think of teaching something like that is actually doing it with a group of students, where you're in an environment where they can actually stop, you know, where you can stop at different moments and they can say. Well, why did you do that? You know, why did you decide to, to you know, uh, you know, make the drums do that, or, or you know, why did you do? Why did you decide to have that kind of pattern, kick and snare wise, rather than something more like this? And 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 then you can explain. You can kind of open up that moment, which is the kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that you had with those masters, you know. Like I could, you know, I could sit down when I was playing with Freddie. I could sit down and ask him, "Can you show me that on the piano? That thing that you're doing in the song, you know?" And and he would, you know, he right. he, he loved doing that. That that was the the sort of fatherly side of him, you know, which doesn't get which gets short, short shrift in the history historical aspect of him. Uh, uh, especially because you know he had so many other contrary uh, traits and stuff, but he had a really <laughs> super, like soulful, fatherly thing about with musicians. You know, young musicians who played with him. If you, if you, you know, he always had time to to help you understand what he was up to harmonically and and melodically what he was doing. You know, and so. Um, uh, anything, all, all of this to say that in my own small microcosm of my of my career, I'm trying to see what I can 
do to to sort of um, hopefully, you know, at least take maybe you know ten or fifteen here and there young people and 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 sort of uh, at least you know like set them on the right path towards that kind of. I mean, is they, the, we the need we need to get openness. the we need to get the Larry Klein big band going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this I, I want to. This is. Uh, uh, I want you to take a listen to this audio sound, uh, another interview, uh -huh. and uh, and then uh, listen to the content, and we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. One of the funniest examples for me was one time we went to uh, we played at a hotel in Rochester, New York. And it was one of those times when it was a, a record-breaking snow and cold <laughs> happening. Right. We're in the bar, only people in the bar. One guy came in, sat there all night. At the end of the evening, he came over to me, and we started talking. He said, you guys like this music you're playing? So we said, yeah, we, we, we love it. That's why we're out here doing it. So he said, man, there's nobody in here. So I said, man, it's record cold and snowfall outside. People don't want to go nowhere in this kind of weather. He said, man, if you were playing uh, marching music, John Philip Sousa music, right. You'd have people in here marching around this club, bumping into each other, because there would be so many people in here. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me realize that, man, there's people out here that love all kinds of music. Right. It just takes situations that makes one successful or maybe one not successful. But all of them have a, have a, a place. And there's a time for each. Now, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying a lot of the jazz things are past their time, but um, the way that we're presenting it is going to have to change. You know who that is? God, the voice sounds so familiar. And yeah, I'm because because he was out. because he was because he was right to your left for many years. That was Carl Burnett. Oh my God! Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, but I want I you. I love that. I love that guy. Dude, honestly, the the music that I, I could honestly, and I love Freddie, but I could just listen to that rhythm section of you, Childs, and Carl just burning away, and Hadley, oh, freaking man. love that. But he said at the end, he goes, the way that it's presented. And Herb Albert told me too, the way the music is presented now, where you have, you know, does that, is that something that you think about as well? Where, it, you know, you, you open the tune, you play the head of the tune, and then you have a horn solo, piano solo, bass solo, drum solo. Does the present, he, and what he said was the musicians have to come together and make that decision. But as far as presentation, how do you feel about, the, in, you know, in the context of melodic instrumental improvisi improvisatory music well if if, if if i speak without uh beyond genre you know yeah. if i just speak about music um there are th certain things opinions that i have uh, that and they and they are colored by the time that we live in now and the way that things and i think that i think that uh um for example, you know, you know, for me, bass solos are a thing of the past, you know, and and and. And why? That, why do you? Why you mean? You say that because? Why do you say uh, that? Well, it's because the pace at which culture well not not our culture our world you know the pace at which things move and the way that the way that uh, uh, the world is at this point to, for, for me the, the thing that um, you know, like for a for a bass player the thing that thrills me when 
most when I go to see uh, music is is the compositional play, the compositional aspect of what the bass player is doing, and 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 this goes for this goes you know I could kind of extrapolate on this for for each instrument in a way because because I think you know there's an element. Um, uh, you know, at this point in in the way that our world is, that that makes that you know <laughs> that old joke about uh, the drums must never stop. Uh, well, why why must the drums never stop? Well, bass solo. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah, that, right, uh, right, right. That that you know that makes that kind of true in a certain way because because people. You know, the, um, it's very difficult difficult for for people to to just sit and and um, and listen to a bass player play without anything else going on, unless it unless it's just you know some sort of has some sort of compositional um, beauty to it beyond just the solo you know because and and this this kind of applies for me it reaches out into other every instrument in that in that um something you know like when someone plays a solo for me now the the thing that's thrilling to me is, is where it takes me you know like what are, are are you are you are you going to tell me a story with what you're playing you know right. and when i listen to when i listen to the greatest um uh, you know solos and the greatest players whether it's bill evans or or wayne of course or you know like a lot of these you know the, you know not 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 always but but a great deal of the time they 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 play with this kind of allegorical arc to their to their playing and 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 I just think it's I think it's very difficult to to uh, to do that with bass these days. I did. No, I did. I did. I, you know. It, I, I mean, again, part of it is also Wayne Shorter. You, you use allegories. I mean, Dee Dee Bridgewater told me that you know at nine years old, uh, his his parent around the dinner table, his parents were talking, and they said the United States of America and. Wayne Shorter said, "No, it's the United Snakes of America." <laughs> so I mean, you know, I mean, these guys are almost like marinate. You have to, you don't, you know, Larry. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like there are no right or wrong answers. It's just some of this stuff is not. You can't communicate this stuff verbally. Like I realize that you asked Freddie how to teach you on the piano, like maybe off the bandstand, but oh yeah, there was no time to like. We're so caught up in hanging on words. I mean, we, everyone's lawyering up. We, we live in this, this word-obsessed verbal culture now. And that was not the way music was, especially when you were on the bandstand. So I just, to me, it's like there has to be a sort of a, a, an awakening. But I, but before. But, yes. And, well, well, you know what you're doing? You're doing quite, uh, you're doing something very important by, uh, you know, for example, I mean, there's, you know, you're, it's hard to find a a better storyteller than Jim Keltner. Oh know? my God! Three. I mean, I, we're going I, I, on. Yeah, I mean, this guy is legendary, dude. Oh my God! You know, I could. I, you know, I can tell you. I need every to... time I work with him. No, I want to. I want to spend a full hour on on you and Keltner. I'm serious. I, oh, I, I, I I love him, and and you know what? I've, my nickname for him has always been the Elvin Jones of rock. So, <laughs> so, so dude, that, he was the biggest. Fun. He was the biggest. Uh, anyway, uh, the thing that about my show mm -hmm. that I want to be clear with you about is that, you know, I've done it all on as an independent journalist. You know, how did I find Jim Keltner? I called the LA musicians union and got his cell phone number. And then he agreed. <laughs> to do, I mean, what I'm saying is it's, this has been done. Uh, it's is inside baseball six years mm -hmm. in primary source interviews directly from the source. I'm not caught up in any kind of, so, so I dig you man. And I dig your generation because you know, I'm not getting rich off of this, although I will tell you, when you show this, when you're do, doing something pure and, and sacred like this, uh, 
it, you begin to build a coalition and it's, sure. it's you know, and, and that's the beautiful part of Important. it. And, yeah. and I'm just happy that you guys are still here to be able to, and to be able to, to inspire peeps, man. Cause I don't, I just don't, I, I, I don't want to see, it feels like we are heading over a cliff in some way. And I'm just, I, I, I want, and I think more than ever before, it's important for, for omnivores and people that look at things in a, in a, in a, in a larger sense and to talk about the mysticism and the magic of music and what is most important in, in, uh, if, if that's going to resonate with people today. Oh, I, I, I agree. And I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, that, that it's, it's so important to, to, uh, to get this kind of stuff down in, into some form where people can absorb it who, who come along because, uh, you know, I know for myself that that was, that was like, you know, man, that was the nectar of the gods when I could, you know, like sit as a kid and, and listen to, um, I mean, it still is actually, I gotta say, you know, like when I, when I listen or read, you know, all these chronicles of the Beatles, you know, when, when they were, you know, recording these records and how they were, what, what their, what their process was, what their, how they thought of doing this or that, you know, what did they, what led them to make this sound this way? <laughs> I mean, this stuff, you know, it, it, you know, I mean, but for people who are, you know, I mean, I remember as a kid, uh, you know, I just couldn't get enough of this stuff. And, and the, by the same token, you know, for, for a young drummer to, to come up and, and listen to Jim Keltner tell stories and talk about music. That's, that's as good as education gets. You know? I'm going to send you, well, okay. So the next set we do, I want to do, I want to devote it to Stinson, you and Keltner. And also if you, okay. and also yeah. if you ever played with, uh, I was always curious. I, I just, I just connected with the rhythm section, did two interviews with uh, Howard Scott and Harold Brown from war. And I was like, I wonder if Larry ever, Oh my God. Yeah. The, Oh, no, say, no, no, save, no. That's, say, that's, yeah, no, I, cause I'm telling you, there's so much, war. yeah, oh, dude. And I'm like that dude, I'm like, Larry was definitely, there was, he was, he might've been, cha you were channeling like, you know, Dickerson and Papa D Allen. I mean, I know that there was something going yeah. on in that, in that scene, but I'm going to send you the Kelton interviews because they're okay. all of them okay. are beyond epic. And, uh, <laughs> And, right. uh, and, and much, and, and, and we'll be, we'll, we'll, before the end of the, the, this calendar year, we'll, we'll, we'll connect in person too, but we'll do another phone interview oh, as good. well. Yeah, right? yeah. Let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. Yeah. Much love, Larry. And thank you for having right. a beautiful weekend, man. Thank you, Jake. Uh, always great talking to you. All right, man. Take care, brother. Okay. Later. See ya. Bye, Bye. Bye. Set two in the books with Larry Klein waiting on Michael Diamante. We'll be back right after this.